good afternoon welcome to educate network friend as you know we have organized three lecture on public administration today we will just try to know the evolution of public administration its growth and what is the contemporary nature of public administration and for discussion on this very topic we have in a studio dr g n trivedi he teaches political science in uh, delhi university and has key eye on the development issues and how development administration is helping Uh, to uh, not only to save the public administration as discipline, but also the contemporary problem which have uh, served uh, itself to evolve the development administration. He will talk about all these issues. So, on your behalf, uh, I welcome Dr. J N Trivedi for Edusat lecture. Welcome, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Amrinder ji. Uh, well, uh, as Amrinder ji has already uh, told you that uh, the, the topic of my lecture is. the changing nature of public administration in this lecture i just i just want to focus on the origin of public administration as a discipline and how public administration first emerged as a discipline and translated into practice because discipline is something which is related with ideas academics but practice is something which is related with formulation execution implementation so both the aspects of public administration i'll dwell upon uh and then the break you know the in origin in the beginning public ad administration was something else but with the passage of time it acquired new nature new characteristics and what are these new characteristics i'll also focus on that lastly if time permits i'll also speak on the nature of indian administration how public administration or administration has taken shape in india so first i begin uh, the emergence the origin of public administration in this context i would like to focus that public administration i'll cover two parts the first pre second world war uh, phase and the second post second world war phase so if we take the first part then we realize that public administration is an integral part of state craft since time immemorial you know it is related with civilization we cannot think of any orderly political organization without administration so as a profession as a part of a state it was existing but as a discipline as a discipline it emerged with uh, withdrew wilson he was american president and he developed the systematic understanding of public administration he conceptualized the idea of public administration as an independent as an independent discipline and that that was uh, he up uh, in 19 1887 19th century he shifted the focus from state and government to government in action you know what 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 does he mean by government in action we talk about public administration as a subject as a as an academic discipline but there is a need to develop the idea of public administration which is rooted in practice which manifests more in execution of decisions taken by the government taken by the state so execution implementation part of public administration which he refers as government in action uh in brief he wanted to make public administration as something that is rooted in the practice wilson also emphasized the need of comparative administration to enrich the experiences of its meaning nature and scope you know he also emphasized the need that we have to develop comparative idea about, about administration you know administration is not uniform everywhere a specific situation has specific characteristics so there is a need to know the challenges before administration in different parts of the world in different countries 
and by knowing the problems and prospects of public administration in different parts and different places, we would be able to refine the techniques and tools of administration. So he focuses on, on comparative study of public administration. In other words, he uh, reiterated the need of empirical input to be incorporated in the study of public administration. You know, comparison is not possible without taking, in, taking into account the empirical situation, what is exactly ha happening at the ground level. So Windrow, uh, Windrow Wilson, he is uh, the first to bring public administration in the limelight. Now, the evolution of public administration gradually reduced the gap, as I said, uh, public administration in practice and public administration as discipline. So, with the passage of time, with the evolution of public administration, this gap reduced in the practice of public administration and teaching of public administration as a discipline, both synchronized. In the context of India, it was felt that it was realized that there should be proper synchronization of, of practical aspect of public administration and its moorings in the intellectual tradition. You know, something emerging out of intellectual tradition, something comes out of, of, of deep thinking, that's something unless it is implemented in practice, it has no, no meaning. So there is a need to synchronize the intellectual tradition, creative aspects of public administration with its practical aspects. Only then, uh, only then it will uh, bear the fruits for, for, for the society, for the country, for the administration. So uh, this was the realization. Now with this background, in recent years, if you, this is the beginning of public administration, but in recent years, public administration has, has made a fundamental transformation. It has acquired new characteristics in the context of liberalization in the decade of 90s, which saw the advent of a new corporate millennium. You know, the decade which has started, the decade of 90, is a watershed so far as the nature, changing nature of public administration is concerned. It, it is a watershed because the basic premise of public administration rests on some sort of the idea of a state, that a state would play important role. But, and this, this continued for, for a very fairly long time. So now we find rapture. With the, with the decade of 90s. And that rapture is in the sense that now the role of a state is going down. And it is, a, as I said, it is a corporate millennium. Now different actors, they are calling the shot. Market is accorded, accorded significant place in, in administration, uh, in, 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 in uh, addressing the problems of the people. So this resulted in, in a movement towards a new era of corporate millennium. Important structural as well as ideological changes have contributed to the, ch contributed to the changing character of public administration. Thus, the nature of public administration has substantially changed and it has adopted the character of corporate governance. So this is the present state of public administration on which I'll, I'll later on I, I come, I, I elaborate this point in detail. Now there are several approaches to conceptualize the evolution of public administration. But I don't want to uh, identify all these approaches. For the convenience of this lecture, I divide uh, I divide, broadly divide the evolution of public administration into two dominant phases. 
the first traditional or classical or Weberian phase of public administration, Max Weberian phase of public ad administration. The second is a non-classical behavioral or non-Weberian phase of public administration. So these are the two, two important or two dominant phases of the evolution growth of public administration. First, Weberian and the second, non-Weberian phase of uh, phase of public administration. The first period belongs to the pre-Second World War period, which focuses on formal structures of administration. The later phase in the post-Second World War era, post-Second World War era, shifted its focus on informal and behavioral factors. You know, the first, the Weberian phase is much more related with the state. It is related with the formal structures of bureaucracy. But the second phase, post-Second World War phase, it is related with formal structures as well as informal and behavioral factors related to public administration. So with this preliminary observations, this introductory remarks, I would like to, to dwell upon the evolution of public administration as a discipline, how it has emerged as a discipline. Uh, as I said in the beginning, that evolution of public administration is dominated by different school of thought. But a systematic study of the discipline first began with the public first began with the publication of Woodrow Wilson's famous essay, The Study of Administration, in 1887 in the Political Science Quarterly of America. You know, this essay is a landmark so far as the evolution is concerned, the study of administration. In this essay, Wilson referred public administration as science which was an intrinsic part of the orderly, organized, and efficient world of business. This is the characterization of public administration, which he mentioned in this essay, that it is an intrinsic part of orderly, organized, and efficient world of business. It was separate from politics and was confined to the execution of policies. This is also very important. There is an insulation between administration and politics. Administration has nothing to take from politics. It has, it has, it, it has to confine itself to the excuse, execution of policies. It has nothing to take from politics. So he, he also uh, focuses on the need of separation of administration and politics. Uh, now the justification, you know, uh, why there is a, uh, why so much emphasis on insulation of administration from politics. The justification for politics administration dichotomy laid the foundation for identifying objective principles and scientific functions of administration. You know, this is the background, this is, this is the basis which enabled, which, which facilitated the process of identifying objective principles and specific functions of administration. You know, in this context, I would like to quote Frank Goodnow, an advocate of juridical approach. He, was, he, he adopted a legal approach, juridical approach to, to define the contours of public administration. What he says, he wrote a book and the book is Politics and Administration. In that book, he clearly says that politics has to do with formulation of policies. You know, politics has a specific role. Politics and state, they are mainly concerned with the formulation of policies. You know, this is the domain of the state and politics. Uh, and politics uh, represents the will of the people. Politics uh, gives effectiveness 
to the expression of the people. So, and how, how, how does politics or how does the state give effectiveness to the will of the people? By formulating policies, by formulating policies. But administration is more concerned with the execution of these policies. Administration is not representing the will of the people. Administration is, is, is accountable to the political bosses. They are not accountable to the people. So their legitimacy is in the overall state system. So what uh, uh, Frank says that the administration or bureaucrats, they have to execute these policies framed by the state. Thus, public administration was defined in a narrower sense, which was apolitical in nature. So it clearly emerges out that it is apolitical, it, it, it concerned doesn't lie in the realm of politics, it concerned lies only in the realm of implementation. Now we take, we further proceed and then we find in 1920s, public administration begin, began picking up academic legitimacy when Leonard D. White's book, Introduction to the Study of Public Administration in 1926 reflected the general characteristics of administration as non-partisan. You know, in, in this book, uh, Leonard D. White's book is a very famous book, Introduction to the Study of Public Administration. And this book has, 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 has contributed in according legitimacy to public administration as an independent discipline, as an academic discipline. And what does he say? This book came in 1926 and he like uh, a previous scholar, he also reiterates the need of administration to become non-partisan. Public administration was stated to be value free. It does not have its own values. It is value free, science and the administration in practice would aimed at economy and efficiency. It was a scientific inquiry based on facts which kept the social, psychology, psychological and behavioral factors out of its study. You know, a D. White's attempt is again the same, that it is a value-free subject, its main concern is scientific inquiry, and uh, it has nothing to take with uh, society, psychology, and behavioral factors. But he, ha the public administration has to arrive on conclusion scientifically. It has to adopt scientific methods to arrived at valid conclusions and for, for arriving at valid conclusions there is a need there is a need to to make a separation from other important activities of human life as i said social psychological and behavioral again there is another uh, a scholar w f willoughby willoughby's book came in 1927 principles of public administration it reinforced again the same the tradition in pre uh, second world war the, the emphasis of all these scholars was on public administration as a scientific discipline and they all wanted to make a separation between politics and 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 administration so in that book willeby in 27 principles of public administration he re, uh, reinforced the scientific principles of administration which could be applied successfully in any administrative set, setting. You know, he also emphasizes general, uh, general aspects of administration. If it is scientific, if it is value free, then that kind of public administration can be applied to any administrative setting without any cultural difference. It doesn't matter because it is scientific and value free, so as scientific discipline as a, as a scientific method, it can 
work efficiently in any any social cultural setting in that context i would also like to mention the structural approach to uh, to the study of public administration based on seven principles this is very important and in classrooms these seven principles are spelled out again and again in short it is called post post corb p o s d c o r b p stands for planning o stands for organizing s stands for staffing d stands for di directing c stands for coordinate coordinating r stands for reporting and b stands for budgeting all these seven aspects they constitutes they constitute the structural aspect of public administra administration and this seven principles of public uh, structural aspects of public administration they were enunciated by luther gallic luther gallic and uh eurewick in their essay 1937 uh the name of their essay was the science of administration in this science of administration both gallic and urwick developed these seven structural principles of public administration and above uh, and they they they, uh, they state their position that the thrust of public administration is on a centralized model of administration as a requisite for efficient and effective functioning of democracy if these seven principles of seven principles or these structural aspects if they are followed then it will ensure effective functioning of democracy so this is uh, th these are the scholars who have developed uh, uh, public administration as a discipline but without mentioning max weber we would not be able to appreciate the nuances of public administration you know the uh, the classic work of max weber on bureaucracy is very important so i uh, in brief i just mention some aspects of weberian bu bu bureaucracy max weber's ideal theory of bureaucracy refers to the class character of society how he refers uh, this ideal bureaucracy as a class character of society he believed that capitalism and bureaucracy mutually reinforce each other you know the growth of capitalism the capitalism can deliver only when there is a there is mutuality between capitalism and bureaucracy without mutuality it is not possible for capitalism to deliver so in that sense uh, he refers uh, the class character of society he defined bureaucracy in terms of its its structural and behavioral characteristics unlike many scholars he applied the concept of bureaucracy to all forms of organizations you know his his concept of bureaucracy is not only limited to administration but his concept his idea of bureaucracy is uh is related to all large organizations all la large human organizations all forms of large organizations such as civil civil service political parties universities and industrial enterprises and there there there, there is a need of bureaucracy and he says that both public and private administration they are increasingly becoming more and more bureaucratized so the bureaucracy is the soul of all human organizations without bureaucracy without efficient bureaucracy it is very difficult to run any organization it is not simply it is not possible he had located a kind of organization which is impersonal where authority is exercised by administrators only by only by the virtue of office the they hold 
he says that bureaucrats this uh, bureaucracy should be based on defined hierarchy of authority written rules and regulation division of labor and political neutrality you know these are the characteristics features of weberian bureaucracy you know he says clearly uh, that that there should not be any confusion there is absolutely no scope for confusion and how how one can eliminate co confusion one can eliminate confusion if there is a defined hierarchy of authority a written rules and regulation well defined division of labor and above all political neutrality you know administration does not have any political shade it does not does not support any political opinion it must maintain political neutrality for its effectiveness he argued that bureaucracy based on such principles has advantage has advantage of certainty neutrality precision and predictability all the classical thinkers defended public administration that was weberian in nature you know all the, uh, the, the weberian uh, notion of bureaucracy is a landmark it's it's, it's a uh, seminal scholarly work and all classical uh, classical scholars classical thinkers they referred weberian bureaucracy or, or his ideas of bureaucracy again and again british colonial administration in india is a classic example of weberian bureaucracy uh so this is this is a uh, the development of public administration as a discipline the main is main now i come now i just want to show that there is a break there is a break of this kind of formal nature of administration all these scholars the scholars which i have quoted all these scholars they have emphasized the formal nature of administration they have emphasized the scientific nature of administration and they have all there is a unanimity that politics and, and administration both are both are separate both are not only separate but but distinctively separate but now just i want uh, i want to 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 come to that gradually this position uh, this position was diluted and on that aspect i'm i'm just quoting uh, some other scholars the mainstream public administration as separate from politics was challenged by chester i bernard's work the functions of the executive this is the book which he wrote chester bernard the functions of the executive and this book came in 1938 the other uh, scholar uh morstein marx in his edited book elements of public administration and this book came in 1946 both these scholars questioned the assumptions that politics and administration could be dichotomized they did not believe in dichotomy of politics and administration in 1950 the dichotomy died they did not both uh, uh, both chester bernard and morstein marx they disagreed with this separation of uh, politics and administration as a result in uh, from 1950 the dichotomy died with the declaration that the, this dichotomy the dichotomy of politics and administration died in 1950 with the declaration with the declaration that a theory of public administration means in our times a theory of politics also you know if you want to enlarge the focus of public administration if you want to uh, embed public administration in the so social psyche in the behavioral pattern of individual and society then you cannot shy away from politics that's that is why this this is a very important declaration a theory of public administration means in our times a theory of politics also consequently the nature of public administration was fundam fundamentally altered and instead of science based instead of science based on facts the focus was on social psychology administrative behavior and democratic values so this is the first break this is the first change changing nature 
you know the earlier from earlier uh, nature of public administration it 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 acquired it, it broke the wall of separation between administration uh, and uh, and and uh, politics both both uh, both are not separate but though both are integral integral part of each other there is a mutuality in administration and politics with this uh, break i would like to uh, focus on public choice public choice theory this is also a part of new public administration the public choice approach is another landmark in the evolution of public administration as a critic of the hegemony of bureaucracy vincent ostrom conceptualized democratic administration as being based on two underlying assumptions you know this vincent ostrom ostrom is credited with with developing a, a new understanding of public administration and this new understanding is based on two underlying assumptions the first is individuals act rationally with adequate information and ordered and ordered preferences you know the rationality of individual cannot be cannot be uh, you have to accept that individual or uh, it is inherent in the nature of human being that they act rationally rationally and they have ad adequate information and with on the basis of those informations they form ordered ordered preferences so this is the first principle the second principles individuals are utility maximizers you know so though these two principles are very important thus a theory of public organization so this these two principles or public choice public choice approach to public administration gave rise to a new concern a new nature you know new meaning to public administration so a theory of public organization to serve consumer interest and preferences was constructed you know <clears throat> a theory of public organization you know this uh, public choice uh, approach gave rise to a theory of public organization to serve consumers interest and preferences are constructed this approach this public choice approach challenged the hegemonic position of the state as well as bureaucracy and emphasized the role of non state agencies such as private sectors you know now this is this is the emergence of non state actors earlier the, uh, in the beginning public administration was moving with formal structures of the state but now uh, with the emergence of public choice approach and non state actors they were emphasized the emergence of non -state, non state agencies were recognized and in this non state agencies private sector emerges prominently and what is what is the role of private center, uh, private sectors private sectors it was projected as citizens friendly and can cater to the interest of the consumers it can efficiently cater to the interest of the consumers the critical theorist also believe that the public interest and bureaucratic interests are at are at logger heads and co concentrating power in the hands of bureaucracy alienates it, alienates it from the public you know so the, the it's not just i want to simplify it that public interest and interest of bureaucracy both are not synchronized both are not friendly always so in such a situation if you concentrate more and more power in the hands of bureaucrats or in in the hands of administration then then it will lead to the alienation of common people it will lead uh, it would it would it would lead to alienation of of uh, general masses so this is the beginning of 
a new public administration. That, thus, while in the past public administration was claimed to be neutral, public administration was claimed to be neutral and value-free science, the new public administration postulates that public official should drop the facade of neutrality and use their discretion in, and in administering social and other programs to protect and advance the interest of the less privileged group in society. This is very important. And also this, this new public, emergence of new public administration, what does it say? That there is, there is no need to keep administration away from politics. You know, administrators, they have to use their discretion. And if they use their discretion, discretion if you, they, 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 they use their decision-making power, then probably they would be in a position to serve the interest of poor masses. The masses who are underprivileged, they, they, they are not reaping the benefits of state policies. So if, if administrator, admi, administrators, bureaucrats, if they, they use their, if they apply their mind, then they would be in a position to deliver, they would be in a position to, to provide a better model of governance so far as the marginalized section of society is concerned. So this is possible only when we have to, we have to change the traditional nature of public, public administration. Traditional nature of public administration is not in a position to, to, to take the horizon of public administration on a larger plank. Now, I come to the contemporary time of public administration. In the 90s and early 1990s, in the globalizing era, there was a need for governments to reinvent themselves, less in terms of power and hierarchy and more in terms of partnership and collaboration. You know, this is, this is a fundamentally different era. Or if I say that there is a paradigm shift in the direction of public administration, or, or there is a paradigm shift in the nature of public administration, in the era of globalization, public administration has acquired new meaning. It does not have single location. A state is, is not the only, only location where, uh, from where public administration draws its uh, sustenance. There are multiple actors involved in the task of administration, involved in the task of governance. A state is not the sole, sole uh, spokes or sole uh, state is not the only provider of services to the people. There are multiple actors, multiple service providers to the, pe to the people. So this is a fundamental break. This is a, a paradigm shift. And that is why I am saying that this paradigm sh uh, shift is more reflected in terms of partnership and collaboration. Now the hegemonic role of the state is challenged due to the economic reforms based on neoliberal ideologies. You know, neoliberal neo ideology, it is an ideology of market. Market is given importance. The role of a state is diminishing. Uh, the focus shifted to market mechanisms, which promoted competition between diverse providers of goods and services. This shift is called new public management, which focuses on the entrepreneurial government. You know, so today it is a catalytic government which is catalyzing all sectors, public, private and voluntary, to compete in order to maximize the level of performance and minimize the cost. P uh, performance, efficiency, outcomes, component of, they, they are all components of good governance. You know, the public administration in the face of liberalization, privatization and globalization, 
it has developed a new idioms of administration and this new idioms of administration is the concept of good governance and this concept of good governance is premised on public private partnership it is premised on decentralization it is premised on participation participatory mode of participatory mode of governance how to empower the local institutions of governance that is why we find that here in india we have uh, panchayati raj uh, panchayati raj system panchayati raj uh, system and oh, centrally sponsored schemes centrally sponsored policies they are implemented by local level bureaucracy or by the local uh, local political institutions of governance three tier panchayati system in india so this is a, a all pervasive feature of public administration it is now pushing the agenda of good governance and in this pushing the agenda of good governance there is there is a need to ensure partnership there is a need to ensure collaboration there is a need to to empower local institutions and in this context it is also very important that civil society organizations they have come up in a big way to play very important role to play the important role of 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 delivering so a state is not you know if there is a the crisis of legitimacy for the state then that crisis is taken care of by by such type of such type of technique of good governance these these techniques of good governance they compensate the losses or compensates up uh, the uh, uh, compensates the losses of governance by the state they play the role far more effective than than the state so this this is this is the contemporary phase contemporary nature of public administration and contemporary nature of public administration is is everywhere we are no longer uh, living uh, in the confines of nation state nation state is there but many of the powers many of the significance of nature state nation state has gone down you know there there is a slogan that live locally and think globally so this is the phase through which public administration is passing through now uh, with this uh, changing nature of nature of public administration i would like to dwell upon dwell upon the situation of administration in india as we all know that india adopted the model of plan development planning commission was established and central government national government played very important role in planning in development in the, in delivery so the bureaucracy it came it uh, it came uh, it it became very important initially it was uh, a many uh, nationalist leaders after independence they focused or they demanded that there is a need to dismantle colonial bureaucracy they have colonial mindset and colonial colonial bureaucracy was much more concerned with maintaining law and order ensuring benefits to the colonial government but now it's independent government and in in the independent government the role of bureaucracy is not merely maintaining law and order india adopted mixed economy india adopted the model of welfare state in such a model welfare state mixed economy centralized planning indian administration was supposed to play developmental role very important crucial developmental role though because of corruption and because of uh, their arrogance elitism uh, many of the welfare uh, measures or many of the policy progressive policies they they were not they were not implemented and i can cite land reforms land reforms the agenda of land reforms 
because India inherited a permanent settlement. Majority of uh, the states of India, there was permanent settlement and it was very oppressive, very exploitative. So even during freedom struggle, the Congress leaders, they pleased, they promised to abolish this permanent settlement, to abolish this Jamindari system, result of permanent settlement. It was abolished and then there was also a promise in Karachi Congress that land reform, reform measures would be implemented. Land reform measures were announced after independence, but land reforms measures is still, it is unfinished agenda. And it is not only because of the lack of political will, it is also because of the, because of the inefficiency of, of Indian bureaucracy, Indian administration, because of uh, corruption, because of their nexus with dominant social interest, they, they could not implement land reforms. But this is the story, this is a uh, old story. Now we have entered into a new, new phase, as I mentioned, that almost the whole world is passing through this phase of neoliberal ideology, this market ideology. Market is playing important role. And in this market ideology, multinational corporations, they, they are coming and they are, they are playing very important role in providing, uh, providing commodities to the native population in bringing uh, foreign, foreign reserve or foreign currencies. There, 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 there are some, sir, some criticisms of, of uh, this uh, aggressive pursuance of globalization, aggressive pursuance of liberal policies. But there are some bright, there, there, there is some bright side of, of, of this uh, phase of globalization. And the bright side of this phase of global, globalization is that there is a, of course, there is a fundamental change in the nature of bureaucracy in India. But this change is good in a many, uh, good in many way. Now, we have multiple governance. We have multiple organizations, organizations of governance. It is, uh, there is a decentralization of power. Panchayati Raj system after 73rd amendment, they have been ma made much more powerful. They have been made effective and they have become the grassroots, very important grassroots organization to implement, to implement policies and programs started by central government as well as a state government. So Panchayat has played a very important role. Now the civil society organization, in India civil society organization is proactive very articulate and they they want they, they are demanding something very uh, fundamental something which which would strengthen democracy which would which would strengthen uh, the idea of governance it would give practical shape to the philosophy of governance and what is that they write to information rti it's a major victory you know this was the demand of civil society organization for very long and it became reality only in 21st century. And because of this RTI, people can know it has ensured a better and effective method of governance. People can participate in the formulation of policies. They can know how much, uh, how much uh, fund is allocated and what is the period, what is the time span of the complete, com completion of that that particular, uh, that particular development work. So, any anything which is uh, related with the state, any development project or any development idea which is carried carried with the help of pub public fund, people have every citizen in India. They have they have every right to get information. So, right to information, it has given a new twist to the nature of Indian administration. Now, we all know that there is a promise of Lokpal bill for the last 42 years and there is a strong movement, India Against Corruption. This movement is led by uh, Anna Hajare, 
but this this would give a again a, a new twist new 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 uh, new dynamism or it will it will bring change revolutionary change in the mindset of mindset of the ruler and the rule you know both are affected there is a demand of citizens charter and this is very important you know the people they, they they are asked to give bribe for getting any information or for getting any any legitimate work to be done by the bureaucrats now citizen charter you know it is the it will ensure accountability of the administration that the basic amenities basic facilities they should be provided within a stipulated time time limit within a stipulated time limit you have to implement you have to implement uh, uh, that basic facilities and if the bureaucrats or if administration or the department concerned fails to deliver in that stipulated time then that concerned department or the con concerned officials would be penalized you know so, so and licensing passport ration card so many distributive aspects so many things are related with with the, with this uh, citizen charter so citizen charter uh, still it is one of the important demands of uh, this uh, india against corruption movement uh, and the government has considered the, this demand many state government in india they have already implemented citizen charters they have made it uh, they have made it mandatory for officials to provide basic information uh, basic information to the to the uh, basic in not only basic information basic facilities within a stipulated time period so th 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 this is very important uh, the last but not the least public administration is something which is which is inevitable without administration we cannot think of any orderly political organization not only a state but any form of organized idea organized institution cannot function in the absence of absence of bureaucracy or in the absence of administration so public administration is in it is inevitable but how to make this inevitability people's friendly and to make this inevitability of administration people friendly you need to develop new inputs new creative ideas as i said that in india there was a demand of right to information and that right to information after the implementation of right to information there is a better governance there is a accountability of not only of bureaucrats but there is a accountability of political system political classes similarly there is a demand of citizen charters citizen charter is what it is something to ensure better governance to to provide basic facilities to the ruled to the people so what i what i want to say that that this changing nature of public administration it has brought in line in the focus that there is a need to develop new insights so far as public administration is concerned whether here in india or anywhere democratic governance is possible only when we develop creative ideas we develop interdisciplinary approach only then the changing nature of changing nature of public administration will correspond to to the demand of the people thank you very much so how this evolution and the contemporary trend will lead to the behavior of a bureaucrat now as i said that these these novel methods the rti citizen charter these demands citizen charter in many of the developed democracy they have already implemented so because that that ensures uh, accountability if you do not fulfill if you do not uh, uh, deliver in that stipulated time then you would be penalized nobody wants to be penalized 
nobody wants that his cr should be ruined so because of because of these these novel ideas because of these new inputs mm. rti citizen charter and multiple uh, multiple organization organs of governance mm. local level governance uh, cso's civil society organizations all these these actors all these novel ideas they have played positive role in terms of governance in terms of ensuring accountability of bureaucrats as well as the accountability of of the political class okay so well friends with this part we would like to conclude the lecture here and we will continue our uh, discussion tomorrow and after tomorrow on uh, administrative behaviors so today i thank all of you for watching the lecture on your behalf i also thank dr jain trivedi for giving such an insightful lecture on the changing nature of public administration thank you very much Thank you.